The scene opens with a man named Mike standing in front of a large glass case filled with a variety of handguns. This case consists of four cabinets placed end-to-end, -end, each well-lit, showcasing around 100 different guns. Mike's attention is drawn first to the .22 caliber section, where he sees small target pistols and six-round revolvers. He examines the smallest of the guns, contemplating the destructive power that even a tiny bullet could cause. Mike moves further down the case, evaluating guns of increasing caliber. He examines .25 caliber handguns, shiny, small enough to fit in a pocket, but concludes that these weapons wouldn't inflict the damage he needs unless he was very close to his target. His search continues as he inspects .32 caliber and then .38 caliber weapons. The .38S catches interest. He recalls that police officers used to carry .38S, and this reinforces his belief that these guns are lethal enough for his purposes. Next, Mike examines a range of 9mm pistols. There are various types, including revolvers, clip-fed pistols, and even a single-shot model. The stopping power of these weapons seems evident from their size and shape, and they come in a range of finishes, chrome, blue steel, and black. Mike is methodical in his evaluation, thinking about which gun will serve his needs best. The narrative shifts to Mike's past, revealing that he had experience with firearms during his time in the Air Force, stationed in Germany. Though it has been a while since he last used a gun, he's recently refreshed his knowledge. His attention is briefly drawn to other impressive guns, such as a .44 Magnum and a .357 Magnum, but he ultimately decides that the 9mm is the best choice for his plan. After making his decision, Mike purchases a 9mm handgun for $850 using a stolen credit card with a fake name, confident that the bill will go to someone else. He leaves the store and returns to his rented Lexus. The story reveals that Mike's deception is intricate. The name on the credit card matches a fake driver's license he also obtained for $200. His ability to weave false identities into his plan shows careful planning and a lack of concern for consequences. He drives to a Hilton hotel, registers using yet another fake credit card, and checks into room 921. However, his true interest lies in room 821, located directly below his own. The narrative hints at his intentions as Mike pulls on latex gloves upon entering his room, careful not to leave any fingerprints. As he moves about the room, he reflects on the things he's learned from TV shows like CSI, particularly about DNA and trace evidence. His thoughts suggest that he's prepared to deal with any potential forensic risks. Mike takes precautions, but at the same time, believes certain risks won't matter. After settling in, Mike rests for a while before heading downstairs for dinner. He alters his appearance with a fake beard and cheek inserts to change the shape of his face, demonstrating how far he's willing to go to remain undetected. His long gray hair completes his disguise, giving him the look of an older man. Over dinner, he watches a basketball game though he isn't really interested and casually observes the surroundings. His focus remains on his ultimate goal, as he calls room 821, but no one answers. Back in his room, Mike begins executing his plan. He retrieves a drill and a small vacuum from his suitcase, then carefully drills a small hole through the floor of his room and into the ceiling of room 821 below. The hole is precisely 9 millimeters wide, just large enough to see through, Using a tiny camera, Mike checks the position of the hole and is satisfied with his work. The camera shows him a view of the bathroom below, and he's pleased to find the layout matches his expectations. The hole is perfectly positioned so that anyone standing at the sink in room 821 will be directly beneath it. Mike's thoroughness is evident in how he disposes of any evidence. He knows the small amount of dust from the drilling will likely be cleaned up by hotel staff before the room is used again. Confident in his timing, he watches the room below through a monitor. The camera he installed has a motion sensor, alerting him whenever someone enters the bathroom. Eventually, Mike watches as a man enters the bathroom in room 821. The man brushes his teeth and shaves, unaware that he's being observed. A woman soon joins the man and they kiss, both naked. Mike shuts off the camera, apparently having seen enough, 
and goes to bed. In bed, his thoughts turn to his brother Shane and a woman named Monica. Monica was originally a product representative for a software company, but she met Shane at a convention in Orlando three years ago. By the time the conference ended, she had left her job to work for Shane, and within a year, they were married. Mike harbors resentment toward Monica, noting how she's had plastic surgery and now clings to Shane's arm at public events, presenting the image of a perfect couple for PR purposes. Mike recalls an incident from two weekends ago when he was in Orange County for a business meeting. While waiting in a hotel lobby, he saw Monica walk in, followed closely by Paul, Shane's business partner. To Mike's shock, Monica and Paul appeared to be intimate, walking arm in arm as they checked into the hotel and headed to their room on the sixth floor. This revelation sets the stage for Mike's current plan, as it's implied that his observation of Monica and Paul's affair has something to do with the actions he's now taking, who is discreetly investigating a potential affair involving his brother Shane's wife, Monica, and Shane's business partner, Paul. Mike, who seems to be a resourceful and calculating individual, gains unauthorized access to a hotel's reservation system under the guise of fixing a few minor issues. While fixing these problems, Mike slyly checks the reservations for rooms on the sixth floor and discovers that Monica Samuels has been staying at the hotel multiple times over the past two months, though her husband, Paul Samuels, hasn't been listed as a guest. His suspicions grow when he finds out that Monica and Shane's business partner have been meeting frequently in various hotels over the past 10 days, leading him to conclude that they are likely having an affair. Using his technical skills and access to computers, Mike digs deeper into the evidence of the affair. He wonders whether he should tell his brother Shane about what he has uncovered. During a casual dinner with Shane, Mike subtly broaches the topic by referring to a recent news story about a wealthy man whose wife was cheating on him. The man lost millions in a divorce settlement, prompting Shane to remark that if he were in a similar situation, he'd prefer to kill his cheating wife rather than divorce her. Mike decides against revealing what he knows about Monica's affair and instead plans his next steps carefully. The next day, Mike leaves the hotel, making sure to cover his tracks meticulously. He spreads various skin cells and small hairs throughout the hotel room, which he had gathered from discarded vacuum bags. He uses these biological materials to confuse any potential forensic investigation, creating the illusion that multiple people had been in the room. After removing his gloves and discarding them, Mike returns the rental car and makes his way to the airport, where he spends a night in two different terminals to further obscure his movements. Later, Mike rents another car and returns to a gun shop located about 80 miles from the Hilton Hotel, where he picks up a 9mm handgun that he had purchased using a stolen credit card under the name Jack Williams. He checks into a room on the ninth floor of the Hilton, knowing that the hotel cleaning crew cleans the floor during a specific time each day. Using this knowledge, Mike drills a hole in the room's ceiling, similar to a test hole he had drilled the day before, which allows him to spy on the room above. From his hidden vantage point, Mike watches as Monica and Paul check into the hotel together, confirming his suspicions about their affair. As he continues to observe them through the hole, Mike watches Monica use the bathroom, noting how attractive she is even from a view directly above. He reflects on how he has never understood what his brother sees in Monica aside from her physical appearance. Mike later calls his brother, who is unaware of his wife's affair, and casually informs Shane that he will be out of town for a while, supposedly consulting on a job in Chicago. During the call, Shane reveals that he suspects Monica might be cheating on him, but has no proof. Mike advises Shane to hire a private investigator, P.I., to confirm his suspicions, and he provides the contact information of a P.I. he knows. As Mike monitors the situation further from his hotel room, he observes Monica and Paul through the hole as they get dressed and leave. Mike activates a motion sensor device to alert him if there is any movement in the room above. Meanwhile, his personal car remains parked in the visitor's lot of the hotel, ensuring that it cannot be easily linked to his covert activities. In summary, Mike is a cold, calculating figure who methodically gathers evidence of his brother's wife's affair while taking extensive measures to avoid detection.
He leverages his technical skills to infiltrate hotel reservation systems, monitors his targets discreetly, and uses forensic countermeasures to cover his tracks. Despite having the information that could devastate his brother, Mike chooses not to reveal it immediately, instead playing a longer, more deliberate game. Mike meticulously gathered all his extra gear and carried it down to the car. He stashed everything in the trunk, ensuring everything was hidden from view. Once back in the hotel room, he started cleaning up. Even though he had worn gloves the entire time, he took no chances. Dusting surfaces and wiping down anything he might have touched, including stray hair or skin cells. The only things left to carry were his video camera and a computer case. Though the case wasn't really for a laptop, it was a cover for something much more lethal. Inside the carrying case, there was an empty laptop bag, but it had just enough room for his 9mm handgun. Next to the gun, he had placed a square piece of thick plastic, which he intended to use to capture all the gunshot residue GSR. Mike had learned about GSR from crime shows on television and knew it was the fine particles left behind after firing a gun. If any of it got on him, it could connect him to the crime. A small light on his hidden camera blinked, signaling that it was recording. Mike watched the footage on a monitor as Monica, completely nude, walked into the bathroom. She approached the sink and stared at her reflection in the mirror for a few seconds. Then... Paul stepped up behind her, wrapping his arms around her waist and pulling her close. Mike continued to watch as Monica turned to face Paul, their bodies close, and they began to kiss. Mike knew this was the moment. He quickly switched the camera with the gun, making sure the GSR would be contained. Without hesitating, he pulled the trigger twice. The sound of the shots was deafening, but Mike stayed calm. He resisted the urge to look at the aftermath, and focused on packing up. He collected everything he brought, ensured no evidence was left behind, and swiftly left the room. Mike walked down the hallway, his heart pounding, but he remained composed. He passed no one on his way to the elevator. The doors opened, and a crowd from the nightclub on the top floor joined him. Blending in, he walked out of the hotel with the group and made his way to his car. Ten minutes later, he was on the road, driving away from the scene of the crime. Later that morning, while driving, Mike heard the news on the radio. Millionaire businessman Paul Samuels had been found dead in his hotel room, and his companion was in critical condition at a hospital in Orange County, California. Mike immediately called his brother, Shane. Shane, I just heard on the news that Paul Samuels was killed. Is that the Paul Samuels you know? Mike asked, his voice steady. Shane's response was hollow and emotionless. Yes, that's him. The radio had mentioned that Paul's companion was in serious condition. Is it anyone we know? Mike inquired. Shane hesitated before answering. It was Monica. Mike's stomach tightened. Monica, are you sure? Shane confirmed it. Yes, they were in the hotel bathroom together. Someone shot them both. The police think it was a professional hit. Mike's mind raised, but he kept his voice calm. I'm coming back. I'll be in L.A. tonight. I'm sorry, Shane. Is she going to make it? I don't know yet. I haven't been to the hospital. Listen, don't drive yourself there. You're too emotional right now. I'll be back soon, Mike said, trying to reassure his brother. I'll get there as fast as I can without breaking any speed limits. They hung up and Mike continued his drive home, replaying the events in his head. On his way back, he stopped at a gas station to refuel, paying with his credit card. As the miles passed, more information about Paul's death started to surface. It turned out Paul had been deeply in debt to some dangerous loan sharks and had been cheating Shane in business for over a year. Despite all the rumors, the police never arrested anyone for the hit. Monica survived the shooting, but her injuries were severe. The bullet had entered her breast and exited through her hip, leaving her with a long, ugly scar down the side of her cheek and a missing breast. She would never look the same again. Monica had never been much of a mother, and after she was released from the hospital, Shane wasted no time filing for divorce. She ended up with nothing, just the scars both physical and emotional. 
Shane helped her out for a short time, paying for a six-month lease on a small apartment while the divorce went through. Once it was finalized, her lease was terminated and Monica vanished from their lives. Mike and Shane never saw her again after that. Despite everything, there are brothers who stand by each other no matter what. Mike often wondered if he would ever tell Shane the truth about what really happened that night. The opportunity came during one of their fishing trips, years later. Out of nowhere, Shane turned to Mike and said, It was done to perfection. Mike wasn't sure if Shane was talking about the fish they had caught or the crime he had committed, but they locked eyes, and in that moment, the truth hung between them, unspoken but understood. As they say, blood is thicker than water.